Take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to the book of Galatians, chapter number 3, verse 29, as we continue our exposition through this book. If you're uh, visiting with us today or here for the first time, I want to make sure you've received a, a bulletin because inside that bulletin is some, an insert that allows you, helps you in uh, taking notes during the sermon. And, uh, and then as you flip through that insert, you'll notice uh, follow-up Bible study questions, and those are used throughout our church ministries uh, for people in small groups and so forth, as well as we have uh, one that takes place here on Wednesday nights. And uh, if you'd like to come to study the Bible uh, and pray together on Wednesday nights, you're welcome to be here, and we also have ministries for our young people. So with all of that said, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessings on the preaching of His Word. Our Father, we ask now that You would bless this moment in this worship service. We pray that our preaching would be honoring unto You and glorifying unto You, and we pray that it would be used by Your Spirit to reveal to us the truth of Your Word. In fact, the only thing perfect in this place this morning is the Word of God. And so, Father, we pray that, that, that we would be open to Your Word, that Your Word would transform us, and that, Father, You would make us again stronger, more mature, more equipped, and believers to be able to go out and serve You this week. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Galatians chapter 3, and we're at the very end of the chapter where the Apostle Paul is making some summary statements and uh, let's just read them for a moment, and then uh, we will focus specifically on the last verse. Let's, let's look at verse 25 to get a context. Paul says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is, neither, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Now we're going to focus on that final verse, and the context here, of course, is the fact that the Galatians are non-Jewish people, what we call Gentiles. And they became Christians under the ministry of the Apostle Paul. They became believers. But after Paul moved on, after planting churches in the Galatian area, these men came along, called, we call them the Judaizers, and they were people who were convinced that there is a difference between being a Christian and being a Jewish Christian. There, there is a difference between Israel and the church. And they basically said that there are two types of chosen people. There's the main chosen people, Israel, and then there are Christians, and they are like extras, and basically made these people feel like second-class people in the family of God. They basically taught to be part of the true remnant of God. You not only had to be a Christian, you had to be a Jew. And so Paul wrote them this letter to explain to these Christians how that was false. And he said, in fact, it's very, very clear in his summary in verse 29. Let me read it to you again. It's written in your notes there. I'm reading from the English Standard Version when Paul says, if you are Christ's, in other words, if you belong to Christ, if you are in Christ, notice the text where he says you've been baptized into Christ. If you're in Christ and Christ is in you, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. And so what Paul is saying is Christians are people who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's who Christians are. They are people who have trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They are in Christ and Christ is in them. Now, here's the reality. The first Christians on the face of the earth were who? The first people to trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior was who? The first Christians were Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had fallen in their sin in the Garden of Eden, and when God spoke to them, God gave them 
the gospel, and he illustrated it through the slaying of an innocent animal to cover the shame and nakedness of Adam and Eve. And basically, Adam and Eve at that moment were told about the Savior, this one who would come, who would crush the head of Satan, and Adam and Eve put their faith in this seed that would come, this child that would come, that would crush the works of the devil. So in effect, Adam and Eve were placing their faith in Jesus Christ. Everybody that you see that became a child of God in the Old Testament became what we would call today Christians. They were looking to Jesus by faith, looking ahead in history because he hadn't come yet, but they were looking at the same Jesus we look back in history to. They got saved the same way we get saved. They got saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Even Abraham himself, the father of the Jewish nation, Abraham got saved by faith in Jesus. In fact, Abraham was given a promised son, Isaac. And that promised son meant, was meant to symbolize or look forward to or give Abraham a dramatic picture that there would be the promised Son of God who would come and be the Savior of the world. So all throughout the Old Testament, you find the gospel over and over again pointing to Jesus Christ, and this is how people became Christians in the Old Testament, the same way we do today. Whether you're talking about Adam and Eve or Noah or Moses or David, the church began with Adam and Eve. The church began as a married couple. It, it, was, it was just one married couple. That was the church of God. And then it grew into a whole family. And you see that family get on the ark. And then the church grew into a nation called Israel and a kingdom, the kingdom of David. And now today the church is what we consider local congregations that are scattered around the world to the uttermost parts of the earth. But again, the Judaizers came along in the first century and said, no, no, the church and Israel are two separate groups. And what these men were teaching, the devil has always tried to teach, and that is the devil wants to rob Christians of the promises of God. The devil has always wanted to rob Christians, the children of God, of the promises of God. The devil is always twisting the truth and twisting the Bible. He even did it with Adam and Eve in the garden. It's always been his way of working. But Paul made it very clear the following truth. And write this in your notes. All who have faith in Jesus Christ, write the word all, all who have faith in Jesus Christ are the children of Abraham, the chosen people of God, the true Israel of God. Because we have faith in Christ, like Abraham did, notice what Paul says in verse 29, then you are Abraham's offspring. Again, put yourself in the context of these Gentiles. Here they are living in Galatia, which is modern-day Turkey, far removed from Jerusalem and Israel. And the Apostle Paul is making this powerful statement that you, you Gentiles, are Abraham's offspring. You are true Israel. You are Jews, that's what you would consider a Jew. You're a true Jew in the real sense. Now, I know many might say, I thought only Jews were part of Israel. And the answer is no. Ethnic Jews are not the only one who are part of Israel. In fact, there's only one person in the world that is truly Israel. And that one person is, guess who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus is the true Israel of God, and all who are in Christ are thus the true Israel of God. Now, let me show this to you in the text, because remember, Paul is making this argument to a group of people that had never heard this before, to a group of people who had been taught the opposite, and so Paul is very careful in the way he explains it. In fact, he doesn't just tell them, he opens the Bible and he teaches them that this was always the truth taught in the Bible. That this is not new truth, that this is not New Testament truth, but this is biblical truth. Let me give you an example. Look here in Galatians 
in verse number 16. Look at verse 16. This is what Paul says. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. The promises. What promises? This is the Abrahamic covenant that God promised to bring salvation to his people and redemption to his people and to form a nation that will bless the world. Now notice what he says. The promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. Then Paul says, it does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, notice no S, and then he defines who offspring is, who is Christ. All right, now what did Paul just do? Paul just did a literal, grammatical, historical interpretation of an Old Testament text. All right? Paul didn't just tell them something. He opened the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, went all the way back to Genesis, and he said, guys, look very closely at the text. In the Hebrew, he was able to show them that when God promised the offspring, it was not plural, offsprings, but it was singular. In other words, God made a promise to Abraham not to give him offsprings, give him many descendants, but he gave Abraham a promise of one descendant, one very important offspring, one very important seed or child, and that child, Paul says, is Jesus Christ. That's, that's just amazing. I want you to, isn't that amazing? I love when Paul and these apostles, you know, most of the time when they're writing, they're just telling us truth. But I love it when they quote the Old Testament and explain it for us. Because here they are, 2,000 years before us, brilliant men that had been trained in, like the Apostle Paul trained in Jewish seminaries in those days. He knew his Old Testament. And he was able to go back and do a grammatical study and say, guys, listen, listen, look at it in the text. I'm not just telling you this. I'm showing you in the Bible that God only promised one offspring to Abraham, and he is Jesus Christ. The point being that if you are in Christ, if you are connected to Christ, then you are part of the offspring of Abraham. Isn't that amazing? There's only one promised child. There's only one true Israel, and that's Jesus Christ. And everyone that's in Jesus, therefore, is part of the true Israel of God. The Apostle Paul made it simple, but he didn't just make this theology simple for simplicity's sake. He made it simple for accuracy's sake. He just took it and he dove deep and he said, look, we're talking about one, in our, in our lingo, one letter. It's between having an S at the end of the world and, word and no S. It's plural versus singular. He's saying, guys, it's a truth, but we need to be accurate. That Abraham was promised one seed, one offspring, and that offspring is Jesus Christ. Notice verse number 7 of chapter 3 of Galatians. Paul says it the same truth, a different way. Verse 7 says, Know then that those of faith are the sons of Abraham. Those who are of faith, those who have faith in Jesus Christ, are the sons of Abraham. Notice verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel before a, beforehand to Abraham, saying... In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So this is amazing theology. Theology that was mistaken in that first century by the, by the Pharisees and then even the Judaizers uh, uh, who were coming along in the church and trying to teach that the church and Christians are not the same as Israel, that the church and Israel are separate, and that there are promises in the Bible for Christians, and then there's promises in the Bible for Israel. That's what they were teaching. And so it it caused a lot of confusion. 
And, and the Apostle Paul and the Apostles came along and they taught it correctly and tried to do away with that false doctrine, but it rears its head through the centuries. And it's still around these days. There's still plenty of people out there that teach that the church and Israel are two separate groups in the Bible, that they are not the same. Paul makes it so clear. I mean, he just says... I'm not going to just tell you this. I'm going to show you in the Old Testament that that is a false doctrine. That is a false doctrine. If you are a Christian today, no matter your ethnicity, Jewish or Gentile, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, then listen to this. Let it sink in. You are Israel. You are a spiritual Jew. And I say spiritual because... God meant for all true Jews to be spiritual Jews because being truly Israel and truly Jewish means you have faith in Jesus Christ. Whether you were looking forward to Him coming or you're looking back 2,000 years ago when He came. Either way, you're part of the same chosen people of God. You're part of the same elect. You're part of the same children of God. You're the bride of Christ. Whatever title you want to give them, God has one family of God, one children of God, and you can call them the church, you can call them the family of Noah that got on the ark, you can call them Abraham and, and, and Isaac, you can call them anything you want in the Bible. There's all sorts of titles and descriptions, but they're one group of people. Now, the question may come up then <laughs> with this sermon this morning, somebody might even already be asking it, so what? I came all the way here at 10 o'clock in the morning to hear a history lesson. Is that it? Or just to get some theology, some obscure theology? So what? So I'm a spiritual Jew. I'm, I'm Israel. What difference does that make? Well, friend, I want you to know it makes a lot of difference. It makes a lot of difference for you right now in your life. I want you to consider this. Because of what the Apostle Paul has taught us this morning in the book of Galatians, here's the point. Here's the implication. Every promise in this Bible is for you. Amen. Every promise in this Bible is for you. You see, when people get under the teaching that some of this Bible is for Israel and some of this Bible is for the church, it becomes very confusing because I've literally seen people say, You see this promise? It's not for you, it's for Israel. And then you get to thinking, well, how do I know which ones are for me? You see what I'm saying? And because of that, I've even seen Christians get to where they don't even read the Old Testament because they're not sure which part of it's for us and which part of it's for somebody else. I'm telling you, friend, if you understand what the Apostle Paul taught the Galatians, it will encourage you to open this Bible and love every verse in it. Amen? To read it as a book of promise for you, for you, everything about it. Now listen, we often think of the promises of God in relation to the way He gave the promises to Israel. And you, and I'm telling you, you can, you can learn those promises in the Bible that way, and they're very useful. For example, this is what I mean. God promised Israel about five different categories of things. He promised them land, He promised them wealth, He promised them peace, He promised them health, and He promised them salvation, right? When you read the Old Testament, that's what you get. Promises about land, wealth, peace, health, and salvation. I'm telling you that in Jesus Christ, those promises are for you. They are for you. For example, the promise of land, the promise of land. When you go into the Old Testament, God promised the children of Israel land. In one sense, it was given to them in Canaan land, but Canaan land was only meant to point to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the true promised land. Amen? Read the book of Hebrews and you'll find that Jesus Christ is the true promised land. God has promised you Canaan land. Canaan land is Jesus Christ. Amen? The promised land is not just a little, you know, country on the side of the Mediterranean. 
The promised land, in fact, is the entire earth. Jesus Christ died to redeem this earth, to redeem creation. If you go to the end of the Bible, you don't find God's people just living in a little piece of land on the Mediterranean. You find the throne room of God having kings and and rulers from all over the globe coming in and worshiping Him. I'm telling you this morning, I'm telling you, folks, you Gentiles, you folks from Louisiana, You are part of the true Israel of God. And when God promised land to His people, He promised it to you. This earth is your inheritance. The meek shall inherit what? The earth. This place is for you. That's why in the Great Commission, Jesus said, go into the uttermost parts of the earth. And that He was going to build His church until His glory spread globally. Amen? Or you take other promises like wealth. Wealth. If you misunderstand the wealth promises, then you end up being one of these prosperity preachers, you know, trying to promise everybody a Cadillac or something. But listen, the wealth promises are much bigger than a Cadillac. Amen? The wealth promises are about Jesus Christ. He is the pearl of great price. God promised you wealth. And if you have Jesus, you're wealthy. You're wealthy, you're rich, you're spiritually rich beyond all the riches of this world. Take the land, the wealth, or even peace. Peace, really? Peace on earth? You remember when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the angel said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Jesus is our peace. He's our peace. In fact, write this down in your notes. Number two, every promise God made to Israel is a promise to His church, to His church, whether you're Old Testament church or New Testament church. It's the same people. Every promise God made to Israel is a promise to His church and is realized in Jesus Christ. Notice again in the text, verse 29, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to Promise. Promise. If your theology does not allow you to claim the promises of the Word of God, then the devil has robbed you. This book was written not about one group of people. In fact, this book's not even really written about us. This book is about one person, Jesus Christ. And if you know Him, then everything in this book comes available to you. Amen. Now I'll tell you, someone may say, listen, I, I've heard this, and I've, I've thought it myself. I've, have you ever thought this? How I wish I could have lived at certain moments during Old Testament history and, and was able to see those things those people saw. You ever felt that way? I mean, I'm glad I live today, amen, don't get me wrong, but there were certain moments I wish I could have been a, a, an Israelite, like when they marched around the walls of Jericho, amen, just give me a drum and let me hit that thing, amen, just let me march around the walls of Jericho, let me be there whenever the trumpets blew and the people shouted. I wish I could have seen the walls fall. Don't you? Don't you read the Old Testament and you say, man, I'm a little jealous that I'm in the New Testament era because the Old Testament looked exciting. Great miracles and moves of God. Here's what I'm trying to tell you, friend. What God did with those people in the Old Testament, He's still doing with us today. Amen? There are the wall, the walls of Jericho are falling all around the world. All around the world. People are walking into strongholds of the devil where there are walls and there are barriers and there are things going on and we're not fighting wars to, to defeat the devil. We're not raising guns and swords. We're preaching the word of God. We're opening our voice and blowing the trumpet and the walls are coming down. This book is for you. 
every story in it is meant for you to read it and say, that's my heritage. Those are my cousins. Amen? That's my grandpa, Abraham. That when he was teaching and handing down the Word of God to his children, he was handing it down to me. Which means it's our turn in this generation to be faithful. I'm saying in this room this morning, there's some Abrahams. There's some Sarahs. There's Moses. There's some young Joshuas over here in this youth group. Amen? There's Deborahs and Esthers. There's a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego right here. Daniels right here that will go on to enter into government and politics and and, and be around leaders in this world. See, these people, these names, they, they conjure up such emotional responses in us because they're heroes of the, of, of the Bible. I'm telling you, friend, they're heroes of your heritage. And that heritage has been handed down to you. You young people, you listen to me. Every promise in this book, every expectation that God has for Israel, He has for you. Everything he wanted with his people in the Old Testament, he wants, for, he wants in you and for you. He wants you to be bold and courageous and not fear this world. He wants you to stand up against the giants. He wants you to go out and do battle and face persecution. He wants you to be faithful like David. He wants you to be wise like Solomon. You are the Israel of God. This generation needs to stand up and realize that this world belongs to us. Now let's go out and take the land. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together.